Bono family, my name is Mulia Di Hartano. I will be reading from 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50 through 58. I would like to invite you to open your Bibles and read it together with me. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50 through 58. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. This is God's word. Amen. Thank you, Muliadi. Such powerful words, powerful passage. Glad to be with you this morning. I, I get to, to preach on um, passages that have musical instruments, so that's really fun for me. So um, how many of you have ever imagined the, the sound of that last trumpet? Um, I I've, can only imagine you know, what it would sound like. Um, but there's, there's a scene in, uh, in Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. Um, there's a scene in the book and also in the movie. Uh, where the forces of Sauron have surrounded the white city called Minas Tirith. And uh, the forces of men have suffered much casualties and all hope seems lost. Um, but suddenly you hear the horns of Gondor and you look across the horizon and you see the cavalry and your hope is rekindled. Um, in the book, Theoden, King of Gondor, he cries out, rousing his troops, he says, forth, and fear no darkness. I long for that trumpet to sound. Even today, even though there's a, a lot of uh, beauty and pleasure uh, on this side of heaven, as Pastor Paul shared last week, it's all tinged with a hint of death and decay. And it's not until the final trumpet sounds that we will all be changed. So this is our third week talking about the resurrection um, how, how many of you like talking about the resurrection? I think we should talk about it almost every week. It's so important. Um, and in this final section, the Apostle Paul is reminding the Corinthians that there are some necessary things that need to happen. And unless these things change, we and they, the Corinthians, are not able to inherit the kingdom of God. So in verse 50, uh, Paul says this, I tell you this, brothers and sisters, Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. So flesh and blood is the perishable in this passage. And what is the imperishable? You can say. The kingdom of God. Yeah, it's right there. Um, so what... If flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, what is it that we are to inherit? What is the kingdom of God? So the kingdom of God in scripture is not just uh, God's will. Um, if you think of the Lord's prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. But it is also a realm because he says on earth, your, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So there's a real place somewhere in the universe, and it's maybe not so far 
than we think, called the kingdom of God, where God's rule is fully manifested, not just in a spiritual sense, but in a realm and in a splendor. Um, This is the the throne room of God, a place where the 24 elders, four living creatures, and the myriads of angels are gathered around the throne of Yahweh, worshiping him forever. The Bible describes this place as a place where the presence of God is, a place of unapproachable light. The psalmist describes Yahweh as clothed, wrapped in light. James tells us that every perfect gift comes from above, coming down from the Father of lights. The kingdom of God is a place, a realm of splendor and glory and of awe. Throughout the Old Testament, when people seem to, either by a dream or by a vision, get to this realm, uh, they would be exhausted for weeks after, generally. They would fall on their face when they were in this place, because it was so marvelous. God in the Old Testament went through painstaking measures to describe to Moses how to approach him, and only then it was once a year, and only then one person per year, the high priest. But Jesus, Jesus satisfied this requirement, and that old system was destroyed. He gave us the gift of the Holy Spirit. And one of the things that the Holy Spirit gives us, one of the most important things, is what's called the assurance of our adoption as children of God. The Holy Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance. So in Paul's other letters to other churches, uh, he, he tells them that those who are in Christ have received the spirit of adoption as children, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. And then he says, if we are God's children, then we are heirs. And if we are heirs, then we are co-heirs with Christ. So this is the idea of inheritance that we are going to inherit. We have a spiritual bloodline through the Holy Spirit that guarantees that we will inherit the kingdom of God. But I think that there's a catch And I think that's what uh, the Apostle Paul means when he says that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. And I think that the catch is that we first need to suffer with Christ. I know it's not a, a fun topic, but Romans 8, 17 says, if we, if we are children, then we are heirs. And if we are heirs of God and fellow heirs of Christ, provided that we suffer with him, in order that we might be glorified with him. Everyone in this life will suffer. You've heard of death and taxes, but there's one other guarantee for this life, and that is to suffer. Everyone in this life will suffer. The difference, though, is the answer to the question, what are you willing to suffer for? What are you suffering for? Now, this doesn't mean that we should be like martyrs and seek out, you know, uh, for the sake of earning just pain. Paul was clear in, in his earlier chapter in Corinthians, uh, for, 1 Corinthians 13. He says, even if you give your body, offer your body to, to the fire, and if you don't have love, it doesn't mean anything. So it doesn't mean that we should just go out and suffer. Flesh and blood is the perishable and the kingdom of God is that which is imperishable. And we're going to say more about this in in a little bit later. So Paul continues in verse 51, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in the moment, in a twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. I don't know if you could see it. I love iconography and shapes, and I'm a very visual person. But can you see the, the angel? Yeah, the trumpet. Um, the wings are kind of on the left there. Um, the halo. I don't know if, do, do, if angels actually have halos, but I don't think they do. 
But the Christmas angels do, I think. <laughs> um, so Paul says this is a mystery. We're not all going to die. Not everyone is going to die. But regardless if some people do die, uh, if they are in Christ and they've died before his return, they will be changed at this last trumpet. So right now, the word that Paul uses for those who have uh, died and who are in Christ, are they are asleep. But there will be a moment where those people will be awakened and raised from the dead. I like how uh, in the last couple of weeks, we, there's a lot of metaphors for death and life. And um, both Paul and Jim brought up the metaphor that was in scripture of a seed, right? That will be planted in the earth in order for life to spring forth. And Christians who have died will return to the earth only to be raised from the dead at Christ's second coming. So uh, a little bit nerdy here, but how many of you are nerds out there? I like, I'm a nerd, so you can raise your hand. <laughs> um, I tried to learn about entropy. It got very complicated, <laughs> but I, 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 I wrote this down. I said, death is a kind of equilibrium for human life. It is the highest point of entropy for a human soul. But the mystery that Paul is speaking of is that there is a life source outside that closed system, a person, the triune God, who at the resurrection will literally exchange the physical flesh and blood with a new kind of material, what Paul calls imperishable. It will be a great exchange. We're all going to get upgraded for all my computer friends, Healthy Body 2.0. With new software, but instead of just new software, there's going to be new hardware. Does anybody, does everybody know what that is? I mean, I don't want to assume, right? But the software is like the programming and the coding, the stuff inside. And the hardware is the stuff outside the programming, uh, the, the things that, that make it up. We're going to be made of new spiritual stuff, not just the programming, but the stuff. We're going to be changed. But what's really cool is that this change is not just like a caterpillar cocooning and turning into a butterfly. It's actual new things. It's new material, new substance and essence that is heavenly. So this is going to happen. It will happen, Paul says. Change is going to come. In verse 54, he continues, when the perishable puts on the imperishable, and when the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? So this idea of putting on, you know, the, taking off the imperishable, putting on the perishable, taking off the mortal and putting on the immortality is the same language that is used for clothing in the scriptures. Paul says basically that when this exchange happens, it will be like a person dressed in filthy rags who will then take off those old rags and handed a royal robe made of the finest cashmere and silk. Alessia and I, we went um, looking for a jacket uh, last week and we're like oh this one's made out of you know things this one's made out of cashmere and then we looked at the price tag it's like whoa <laughs> so taking off of the old rags putting on a royal robe made of like that if you can imagine the finest cashmere and silk or and then given a crown and a signet ring with majesty uh, for my nerdy friends who live near cal in 2021 professor lay of the University of Manchester was given the Guinness Award for the finest fabric. Not finest like in terms of rare, but finest in terms of small. Uh, up to this point, the, most, the world's most fine fabric was this, guess, anybody want to guess where it was from? I heard something. China? Close. G Egypt. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so. I'm like Egyptian cotton, you know, Egyptian linens. Okay, maybe it's not a thing. Um, <laughs> there, guess how much thread count there was, the thread counts. You know, if you go to Bed Bath & Beyond, you can get a nice sheets for 
two, uh, you know, I was a budget guy, so 200. <laughs> I think we upgraded to 400 <laughs> recently. This one has, up to this point, it was 1,500, 1,500. 0, 0. So, but this new discovery in Manchester, it's called molecular fabric. And it has a thread count of 40 to 60 million threads <laughs> per square inch. Million per square inch, yeah. Uh, there's going to be an exchange that happens. And it's going to be something that we don't understand. Uh, when this exchange happens, there's going to be, Paul says, these two prophecies that are fulfilled. The first one comes from Isaiah 25. And if you have time this week, go and read that chapter. It's so amazing. This little phrase is beautiful, but it, the whole chapter is incredible. And I just want to share something from you. In, in, in our Bibles, in ESV, it says, it actually says, he will swallow up death forever. It doesn't say um, what, what we read, um, death is swallowed up in victory. There's a little variation. Um, and Paul's probably quoting from either a Greek version of the Old Testament where death is destroyed in power. But the context of the passage is beautiful. So listen to this. God, it says, has been the shade in the middle of the scorching sun. He is a stronghold to the needy and those who are in distress. There is, Isaiah paints this picture of the breath of the ruthless is like a storm beating against the wall, beating and derision and oppression and threats. But Isaiah prophesies that it will not continue forever. The people then are transported on this mountain and it says God will swallow up. It actually uses the words shroud or sheet or veil. I know we were laughing about this stuff, but it, it's in there in the Old Testament. He's going to swallow up the sheet that is spread over the nations. And maybe it's some molecular fabric. I don't know. Then God's people are taken to the feast on top of this mountain. Mount Zion, where there's food and wine, and there will be representatives from all nations. And we get this famous passage, he will wipe away every tear from all their faces. Their blame, their shame, their guilt. God will prove himself worth waiting for. And I know that there are some of us that are struggling now, going through hard times. In Hosea Chapter 13, this also has vivid imagery. It says, death, where are your plagues? And it's kind of weird. Yeah, it, it, if you go back there and find it in your English Bible, it doesn't say, oh, death, where's your victory? It says, death, where are your plagues? So I think Paul was, again, using another version, maybe the Greek or another version of the Old Testament. But death is kind of is giving, given different attributes of a person or of another metaphor that we can think of. Um, when we think of a ship passing on a body of water, the, the thing that, is called, that, it, that it leaves behind is we call it the wake, right? So I think sometimes what, the, what this author is trying to say is that death is kind of passing by, and in its wake is plague and destruction. But God is challenging death and he's saying, oh, death, where is your victory? He's taunting death. And because the resurrection is to happen, oh, yeah, sorry, I had to. Um, God is telling to death, because the resurrection is going to happen, your wake of death, your destruction will not even be a ripple. Death's plagues will be rendered powerless. So this, this other phrase, oh, death, where is your sting? Whereas death is first personified as plague and pestilence, now death is symbolized as a character, uh, a characteristics of an animal. We think of an adder or a serpent, but it could also be a hornet or a, or a locust. I don't even know, um, what, what were those? When we had our men's ministry gathering, there was these wasps. They were eating meat. Like, I, I didn't know that. I guess I live under a rock somewhere, but I didn't know that bugs eat meat, like, like straight up meat from the grill. Um, you know, and, or it could be scorpions, right? 
Um, but either way, this sting should remind us of some of the very first pages of Scripture where it is prophesied that the, the seed of the woman, the offspring, would, would um, crush the head of the serpent and the serpent would strike the heel of the offspring. This is all foreshadowing. The defeat of death is through death itself. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The sting of death is sin, and Jesus bore the burden for us. If we were to continue reading Hosea 13, God says, Compassion is hidden from my eyes. He's talking about a person. Though he flourish among his brothers, the wind of the Lord shall come and his fountain shall be made dry. His spring parched, his treasury stripped. Judgment was necessary. If you read Hosea, you'll read judgment. That was necessary. Jesus had to taste the sting of death for us. But because he tasted it, we will not have to. The power of, the sin, power of sin is the law. And the law is not something that we could have ever or can perfectly accomplish. Jesus is and was the only one who fulfilled it, who lived perfectly, thereby bypassing the requirement of death. If the power of sin is death, Jesus bypassed it because he lived perfectly. Jesus fulfilled the law by his life, and death had no power over him. But he was the perfect atonement for sin. We could not defeat sin or the law. I don't know about you. I am very aware of my temptation, my sin, my shortcomings. And no matter how much I try, even now in this life, I am not perfect. I have not been perfected. And yet, uh, Paul calls us co-laborers of the kingdom of God right now to do his work. In verse 58 of Corinthians chapter 15, it says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor, that in the Lord, your labor is not in vain. This word uh, immovable is, uh, is to be solidly in place, to have an attitude that is founded as if it were upon a rock or set in stone, to be seated. But another way to translate it could be to be well stationed. And when I saw that, I was like, well stationed. That reminds me of war. And this year, um, I don't know if Scott's in here. Scott? Oh, no. He recommended that I watch the HBO series Band of Brothers. Has anybody seen that? Oh, yeah. It's good. Wow. A lot of people haven't seen it. I recommend it. It's not easy to watch, but it's kind of, it'd be good to do in your life at some point, I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the, 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 the show Band of Brothers follows this, uh, this, this, these, um, the 101st Airborne, they're called the Easy Company. They're par they are paratroopers, so they, they, they're the first over the enemy lines, they drop them, and they help, you know, tactically to, to start, um, to, to help uh, the, turn, turn the war. But they're, they're, there's this one part in, this, has happened, this happened during World War II, and they were under the, the leadership of Major Winters. And at some point in World War II, they, they are in France in this place called Baston. And you may have heard of the Battle of the Bulge. It took place here, where it was the army's greatest, it's like greatest struggle against Hitler's last chance for victory. Hitler was basically, he knew he had one effort and he forced all of his power into and troops into this one location that was super tactically important called Bastogne. And here the Easy Company, along with a lot of other people, 
the, uh, I'm just thinking of like, because the, you got to watch the HBO series. They interview the people who are actually there, which is really amazing. You know, the, the real people. Um, they got pummeled, you know, they, they suffered loss and wounds, but eventually Hitler was denied and the war turned the tide. I think that's what Paul's saying. Be immovable. Be well stationed. War is going to come. Uh, remain unshifting and unchanging in the waves and the wind of evil in this life. The waves and the winds of hardship come in many ways. False teaching, false promises, false hopes, false, tr false truths, dead ends, false saviors, but also hardship and affliction and mockery for our faith. But Paul says, abound in the work of the Lord. It's God's work, not ours. Uh, I like to call him my boy D. Willie, Dallas Willard. <laughs> uh, he says some really good things and wrote some really good things. And he says that we must invest our lives in doing what God is doing. Invest our lives in doing what God is doing. And, and I love that we can go back to 1 Corinthians 13. It, the motivation is not earning. We're not earning God's love. The motivation is love that we've received. So we can do all the right things and not have love. We can do Christian work, but not have God in the middle of that work. It might be our work, but is it God's work? One of the most sobering passages about this is Matthew chapter 25, verses 34 through 40, where it's this parable of the sheep and the goats. And on one hand, you know, the shepherd is separating out the goats and the sheep. And uh, some of them say, Lord, did we not cast out demons in your name? And did we not prophesy in your name? And Jesus says, depart from me. I never knew you. You did all this work, but did you know me? And then the king says to those on his right, the sheep, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. There's that word inheritance. The kingdom that's been prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And they ask him, Lord, when, we do, when did we do these things? And he says, whatever you did to one of these brothers, the least of these, your brothers and sisters, you've done unto me. So God's, doing God's work in this life is not fruitless. It is not empty, and it is not vain. Yeah, our work versus God's work, our action versus God's intimacy. All other endeavors are going to perish eventually. Um, there's this song that I learned as a kid, and it's amazing because, yeah, you, you don't know that you're learning scripture as a kid, and then suddenly you read something, and you're like, wait. I, I know this passage. How do I know it? But um, it makes me emotional. Um, but I, I don't think I can sing it. But he it, it says, um, it's great things God has done. God has done great things. I'll say it in Spanish. Los que sembraron con lágrimas, con regocijo segarán. Which means those who have planted in tears will harvest with shouts of joy. And Solano, you may be weeping as you plant your seed now for the kingdom of God, but you'll be singing at the return, at the harvest. You'll be singing for joy. Uh, Tim Keller, at, toward the end of his life, he said, he, you know, he found out that uh, he was having cancer, and so... Oh, I guess I had it up there. Sorry. Matthew 25. 
Tim Keller said this, I never, after finding out cancer and it changing his life and his prayer life with his wife, he said, I never want to go back to the prayer life I had before cancer. The way that you look at God, the way you look at everything changes when you realize your time is limited and you are mortal. So maybe God is wanting you to end your work that he hasn't called you to and to start the work that he's called you to do. Paul is saying it's going to be worth it. It's going to be painful. The death of our endeavors will prove to have eternal life in the kingdom of God. Death to life. Death of our work leads to death of God's, uh, to life of God's work. Or maybe today God wants to encourage you and say, keep going. Hey, I see you're doing the, wor- the work of the Lord. Keep going. But do it in my strength, God just wants us to do. So Solana, let's live today as, we, as if we are to inherit God's kingdom tomorrow. So when the last trumpet sounds at the beginning of our eternal life, the king of the universe is going to strip us from our old rags and replace them with his royal robe and crown and invite you to reign and rule with him. Are we ready for that? Are we ready as a church, Solano? So we're going to have a time of responding in prayer. And as we do that, I would love to have this slide up there. Uh, The prayer team is going to come up after we open the communion table. But I wanted to share some comforts and some challenges. And I pray that the Holy Spirit would be speaking to you specifically These are just, this this is like a shotgun. But the Holy Spirit might be lasering in on something that he wants you to to change. Or maybe to encourage you. So one comfort is, and I put it in God's perspective, if you're going through a hard season right now, one comfort is, I, God, will wipe away all of your pain, your grief, and your sorrow one day. One of the challenges is God asking you, will you make your life count for me? And another comfort is, keep laboring for me, God. It won't be in vain. God's proud of you. You're doing his work. Keep going. It's great. And then one challenge is, Jesus asking, will you do my work or are you just doing your own? Is Martin here? Did we have the little tracks? No, not this week. Next week. Okay. Next week, we're going to be handed some tracks and and they're called the hero of Christmas. One little step that you can do as a congregation that we can do is hand out a track. A track is like a little pamphlet that has the gospel presentation inside of it. And just give it to somebody. Pray about it and have God just, you know, it's easy. Like, they can throw it away if they want. Um, We're doing our our caroling out there this Friday. It's our first time ever trying it. We don't know if there's going to be pastors by that need God. Um, Come support, even if you can't sing. We're going to have fun. It's going to be hot chocolate. Uh, or respond today. Maybe there's something else specifically that God wants you to respond today. So let's, let's pray together. Um, Lord, you know us intimately, God. You know uh, if we are on the front line. Um, you know if we're on the sidelines, God. But um, we're grateful that you are not done with our, our lives yet. And we want to inherit your kingdom, Lord, one day. Um, But flesh and blood cannot, God. And so I pray that you would help us to put to death the flesh and to put on the spirit so that we can rule with you, so that when you return, Jesus, we would not be ashamed, but we would be proud and so excited and so uh, relieved that our commander-in-chief is here, finally. And for those of us who are in uh, grief or distress, Lord, I just pray that you would uh, minister to us today and right now. 
um, through prayer, Lord, through your, your Holy Spirit, through your encouragement. God, yeah, just move among us uh, in your name.